in the book of Acts, chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 31. Verse 31. And I want us to talk about, and we probably won't get through this morning, we have to finish next week, the ideal church. The ideal church. We've been bringing a series of messages on the church several months now, uh, a couple of months I would say, and we'll move on with this for a, a little while. But there's so many things that needs to be said about the church. Now, you know, uh, I was here for 20, uh, let's see, when was it, 19, uh, 12 years, I guess it was, and then went to Raleigh, and now I'm back. And you know I feel a, a, an importance of the local church, how important the local church is. And God works through the local church. And so I want us to talk about the ideal church. Now, you know that I don't preach and don't say a lot about money. When it needs to be mentioned, I'll mention it, but we have some good tithers and so forth. But uh, let me just simply say, we should be faithful in tithing. But I don't preach a lot about that, but I will. I'll bring a full message on the matter of storehouse tithing and how important it is. But let's think about this matter of the ideal church. Let's begin in, ver in verse 31. <clears throat> He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, uh, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended unto the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto thy, my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom he, you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call." And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly received his word and were baptized. They that were gladly received the word were baptized the same day, and they were added. Now, I have that marked in my Bible. They were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that were believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now look at verse 47 again. Well, verse 46, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Precious Father, we think about this church in Acts, and we think about how it was used for your glory. And the thing that you did through this church, uh, absolutely amazing. And Father, we look back on the days of this church. You've done some wonderful things in this church and through this church. We've been able to be blessed 
with some wonderful men and women, some faithful Christians who love the Lord and who have made this church a wonderful place to come. And it's a place where you uh, work through here in this area. And so, Father, I pray now that you will help us to walk with you day by day and use our church in such a mighty and wonderful way. Lord, now use this church and use this message for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. How many people do you know that have the wrong concept of the local church? I meet people, I meet church members again and again and again, and I'll say something like this. Is God blessing your church? How are things going? And uh, I'll get all kinds of answers. And I'll try to ask about their programs and uh, what they're doing for missions and so forth and so on. And I'll meet a lot of members that's been going to a church for a long time, large churches, small churches, but they really do not understand the concept, the biblical concept of what a local church is, what it's made, made up of, what is its calling, what is its real ministry. And so here in the book of Acts, Paul is writing, of course, to the local church there, and he is saying to them some very important things that they need to be alerted to. God had blessed this church. God had used this church in a marvelous way. He wanted to use it uh, more and more and more. For instance, uh, look in verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He wants to use the church to save people and then to call people to go out to reach the lost and to go out to the mission field. Verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. In other words, the generation you're living in is going far away from the Bible, far away from the precepts that's brought out through the Scriptures. Verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine that? That many people being saved in that short period of time? Verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, uh, the word doctrine here is teaching teaching, biblical teaching. This church was blessed because it had biblical preaching and biblical teaching, and they followed that teaching, they obeyed that teaching, and they went out and God richly blessed them and used them mightily. Now, our church can have that. We've seen some of that, but we can have that if we'll listen to this word. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. Now notice what he says. They continued steadfastly in the what? Apostles' doctrine. Who gave the apostles that doctrine? The Holy Spirit did. Amen? So what they were doing, they discovered that on earth, while they were on earth, they were to listen to the Holy Spirit and they were to carry out his plan for the Great Commission to see people saved in the local community, but also to take the gospel to the whole world. And I love verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching and fellowship and in breaking of bread and of prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Let me stop there a second. In many churches today, there's a lot of racket. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of uh, jumping over the pews and screaming and yelling and hollering. Uh, playing rock and roll music. It's more like a dance hall than it is a church. Now, 
I hope that that don't upset you, but that's what I'm hearing now, and that's what I'm seeing now. I had something come in the uh, mail uh, to me as pastor of this church uh, from an organization that said how to double your attendance in just a few weeks, and of course change your music, uh, change the style of your auditorium, uh, change your style of preaching, and down the line. And I read some of that stuff, and I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. There's nothing biblical about it. A lot of noise, a lot of racket, but uh, we want to be a church that is right with, the God, with God and fulfills the Great Commission and fulfills what is being said here about the local church. Amen? Now, uh, I know that seems a little bit tough. We're not a legalistic church now. Don't get your idea we're a legalistic church. But we're a church that wants to obey the Great Commission and we want to obey the Scriptures. And so because of the preaching and the ministry, uh, they that gladly uh, received His Word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, my former pastor, Wayne Williams, brought a series of messages on how the Lord adds and when the Lord adds. Uh, there's times that God will add to the local church, but there's a reason that he does it. And I think we'll find that out as we go through this passage of Scripture. Verse 42, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the same in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added. I have that underlined and marked. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, would you say that church came pretty close to an ideal church? I would. But what about the modern church today? Do they come close? Do we come close to anything like I read this morning? Wouldn't you like for our church and the other churches in the community to have that type of spirit and have what God would call an ideal church. We're going to pray and then we're going to look into the scriptures, but I want you to think about this matter of praying for our church that God might help us to be this kind of a church, an ideal church for his glory. Amen. So here we see the concept of a local church just like our local church. Our responsibility is to preach the gospel. Our responsibility is to daily witness and daily take the word of God to the lost of this community around the Charleston area into South Carolina, around the United States, and around the world. Do you agree with that? You see, our ministry begins right here. Remember the disciples, they began at Jerusalem. They began at their home base, and then they moved their ministry out into the area, into the local area, and then out into the world. Now, I'm so glad that I can say that this church begins right here in this local community, but through our missions program, we reach out to the world. And one of these days, we'll stand with our Lord in heaven, and we'll be able to, I believe, get to meet those that were led to the Lord through the ministry of this local church and other local churches. And so you see, the word ecclesia means a called out assembly. From the time of Pentecost until now, the Lord is calling out from his people a local assembly to take the gospel across the street and to the world. Now deacons, pastoral staff, members, I want us to always take a hard look at what we're doing. Take a hard look at what we are saying, how we're fellowshipping, and what kind of a uh, outreach do we have. 
And is God going to use us and wants to use us more? We never want to be satisfied with where we are. Amen? When uh, I have the privilege of marrying a couple, a young couple, we'll have prayer afterwards, and I like to bring them back into the study before we go out for the meal or whatever and take about 15 minutes and go over some things that I feel is very, very important for a marriage to succeed. And, of course, one of the things I say to them is this. You have to work together. You have to work together. All right, now think. We need to work together as a body. Amen? We need to work together as a body. And we need to agree as to what we're going to do locally and what we're going to do worldwide to obey the scriptures and take the gospel from North Charleston to the world. Now, here's what's going to happen when we do that. God's going to be highly pleased. Highly pleased. A lot of men and a lot of women are going to pass from death unto life because of the ministry of this church. Do you remember the day that you were saved? I remember the day that I was saved, six years old. I remember that for about six months I would cry myself to sleep at night. We had a revival at our church, and our pastor brought in a stirring evangelist. And he preached on salvation and being born again. And he said over and over again, young people, you need to remember, adults, you need to remember that when you die, there's only two places. There's no purgatory. There's no between. There is heaven and there's hell. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus and you die, the Bible says that you will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, I was six years old. But the Holy Spirit, and, and I believe this, listen to me. From the day I was born, the week I was born, my mother took me to church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Even though I was a child. All the way up to six, seven, eight, nine, I went to church with my mother and my grandmother. I got to where I love going to church, and I love the pastor. I developed a love for preachers just as a young man. But I never thought I'd ever be a pastor. I thought I'd work on the farm. But that church had a goal, and that goal was to always take the gospel to the world. And so uh, one night uh, I, I asked my mother, and she said, no. She said, you don't, you don't know enough about it. Well, the next day I went to school. Now, back in that day, every Friday the school system the Ray County school system would bring in preachers every Friday to preach to us, every Friday. Well, that Friday rolled around, and the young preacher came up and preached, and uh, when he gave the invitation, I went forward. And uh, I asked the Lord to save me. And I shed tears as a six-year-old boy, and he had me to stand up in front of the, that congregation of little boys and girls and tell them that I had passed from death unto life. And then he said, now when Sunday comes, you go forward and you tell your pastor. And I did. And that was two of the happiest days of my life. Now you think with me just a moment. The joy of seeing a little boy saved. The joy of seeing a little girl saved. Isn't that one of the greatest things that we, you can experience and one of the most wonderful things that you had a part in leading a boy, a little boy to the Lord or a little girl to the Lord and now you know that they will be in heaven one day. And I've uh, said this over and over again. That preacher that's preached that morning and led me to the Lord, uh, Danny Hodge was his name, I want to see him in heaven and thank him for preaching on that Sunday morning. Now, this comes back to me. I pray that that will happen to me when I get to heaven. I wonder how many Baptists, preachers, regular members, if you want to say that, how many of them will have the joy of going into that celestial city and the Lord says to us, welcome home. And there we begin to meet brothers and sisters from all over the world, from every decade, and there they are, and we'll meet one another. And I've got a feeling that uh, when we get there, we're going to rejoice in that, 
But one of the things we'll rejoice in maybe more than a lot is this. I had a hand in leading these people to the Lord. I had a part in leading that young man, that young woman. I had a part in that. Pastors and deacons, Sunday school teachers, like uh, we have here, working together and seeing a young man saved, a young lady saved. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing it is. But some people have a very soft idea of what evangelism is, of what a church is all about. Um, I'll just be very frank with you. From what I see on TV and what I know about what's going on in a lot of churches today, you don't have a worship, you have a honky-tonk. Now, I'm sorry if that seems harsh, and that won't go with a lot of people. I know that. I understand that. And we're certainly not a perfect church. We, we, have, we have things that we need to, to share up, but I feel that the main thrust of a service is first of all the Word of God, the preaching of the Word of God. We're not going to have a 75-minute song service and 10 minutes of preaching. I'm sorry. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul, spirit, joints, and marrow, and is a discerner, a divider of the soul, spirit, and joints and marrow. The Holy Spirit wants to work in church. He wants some unsaved men and women to come to church, be brought to church. And as the preacher preaches, the Word of God goes out. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God, sends it into the heart, into the mind of that man or woman that's sitting there or that young person. They get convicted. The invitation is given and down the aisle they come. Some of the greatest moments of my life have watched a young man or a young lady or wh whoever come down the aisle, and I'd be standing there with my Bible. Our deacons would be standing there. Associate pastors would be standing there. And that young man come forward, and I would take his hand or her hand. Now, if I took her hand, I would say to her, this is my wife, and I want to give uh, you to her, and she's very competent. She knows how to show you from the Scriptures, and Sue would take that young lady in to one of the, the side doors or wherever and lead them to the Lord, bring them back out, and we would bring them before the people. What I love to do is when they would come in and they would stand in front, boy or girl, they would stand there, and I'd have them turn and look at me. And I would say, Suzanne... Do you know, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that you sin? Yes, sir. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins? Yes. And do you believe if you would ask him into your heart that he would save you? Yes. And did Miss Boofer say this to you? Did she give, go through this with you? Yes, sir. And now I'd say, now, Susan, knowing what you know and after doing what you have done, let me ask you this question. If you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? Yes, sir. Or a young man. Yes, sir. That's one of the most wonderful things that can happen in a church. That's one of the greatest things that can happen to a pastor, a pastor's wife, a member of a local church, is to see a young man or a young woman come for salvation and pass from death unto life. And you know what I've had the joy of seeing? Watching those kids grow up in that church. Watch them go away and serve the Lord. Now, that's what I'm getting at this morning. And we talk about this matter of the ideal church. Well, if we're going to be an ideal church, we have to recognize that we are called out assembly, that we become a portion of the flock of God. We are a portion of the flock of God. That's all over the world. Part of the church is in heaven now. Men and women have passed away. They're in heaven with the Lord. Part of the church is in heaven Part of it is still here uh, on this earth, and it should be our desire that if we're going to really function as a local church, we're going to begin at Jerusalem. Where is that at? Right here. In this community, and I do that every week, and some of our men and women do it every week, we go here. But we want to move from there to the state of South Carolina. You move from there to the United States, you move from there to the world. Amen? 
And so here we have the privilege of supporting 31 missionaries. We were supporting 32, and one of them uh, dropped out of the uh, mission field and didn't go back. And so we're 31, I believe it is, and we're going to pray that God will keep us moving forward. You're going to be hearing from some great missionaries uh, in the days ahead. So I want you to pray that the Lord will help us to be the ideal church. But you won't be an ideal church unless you have a burden for lost souls. When was the last time that you reached into your pocket and took out a, a track or you pulled out your New Testament and you said, Sir, do you know if you died today that you'd go to heaven? No. If you would, would you let me take this New Testament and show you how you can be saved and know it? The man says yes, or the young man said yes. And I'll go over and take them to a side uh, alone, and I'll say, now let me go through the plan of salvation. And after that, I'll say, do you know now for certain that if you died today, you'd go to hell? Yes, sir. Now let me ask you this question. Do you believe that if you were to ask Jesus into your heart that he would save you? Yes, sir. And do you believe that God has the power to save you and give you eternal life? Yes, sir. And I would say now, I want you to repeat a prayer after me and I want you to make it your prayer and we'd do that. After he got through praying himself, after that I would pray. I would look him right in the eye and I would say, John, tell me now, if you died right now, where would you spend eternity? 99% of the time they have said to me, preacher, heaven. I've had those young men and young ladies call me when we would leave that church uh, and go to another church and pastor it in another state. And they would call me and they'd just simply say, Brother Boofer, you remember what happened last year at this time? I said, I think I do. Why don't you tell me? On this day, you led me to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know too many things any better than that. Amen? It's better than a hole in one. It's better than a touchdown. I just simply say, now, think with me now, the ideal church. Number one, the ideal church is a loving church. The ideal church is a loving church. I've, I've preached in some churches that I just almost knew when I walked in the door. It was not a loving church. And after I was there for a little while preaching a revival or a three-day meeting or whatever I, I was preaching, why, you know, you go out to eat with people. The pastor always gets to uh, go out and, and to eat with people. And uh, so we would go out. And so inevitably, in a man's home or at a restaurant, they'd begin to criticize the pastor or they'd begin to criticize the deacons. And I would say to them something like this. When was the last time you had anybody saved in this church? Preacher, it's been five years. It's been three years. It's been two years. It's been one year. And I thought to myself, they're not practicing the scripture. Amen? They're not practicing the scripture. You see, the people in Acts here, they were going to obey the Great Commission. And in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, the word doctrine is teaching. You understand that. You're smart enough. You've been around long enough. That's doctrine. I, I like what it's, verse 41 says, and they, can, and they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That was a revival, wasn't it? And then verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and of prayers. Fear came upon every soul. See, you've got to have a revival that brings tears before you can have the right kind of joy. Amen? Now, you're rejoicing over salvation, but you want that right kind of joy, that great fellowship that brings Christian joy that nobody else can copy. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed, watch this now, all that believed were together and had all things common. Hmm. Would you like to see the Lord do some great things in this church? I know you would. 
I know you would. Then I've got to get right. You've got to get right. We've got to get right together. Amen? Now, fear came on every soul. Great things happened. And all that believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, parted them to all men as every man had need. And then again, they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking from bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This church was a loving church. First of all, they had a love for the Bible. You see that here. They had a love for the Bible. Now, I'm not trying to meddle, but I want to say this first of all. I'm going to make sure, I want to make sure that I spend time daily right here. I must, I must have in my mind and in my soul and in my heart the teaching of this book. Years ago, we had a memory verse contest at Pleasantdale Baptist Church. And our pastor made sure that we young people at that time memorized the Bible. And uh, we would have that contest. And, of course, the one that won the contest would get a beautiful Bible or a beautiful New Testament and hand it over to them. We'd have six or seven girls over here, six or seven guys over here, and we'd all be memorizing Scripture. And if you memorize all of the verses, and I remember... When that was over with, we had young men and young ladies that could quote up to 40 verses of Scripture without stopping. 40 verses of Scripture without stopping. You know what that pastor wanted? He wanted God's Word to be hid in our heart. That's what he wanted. Now, I know young minds have a better opportunity of memorizing that many verses than somebody as old as you folk are. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. That slipped out. Lou, I, I mean it. I apologize. I'm sorry. You, you, boy, you gave me some darts there. But, the, but you know what happened? The adults got the message. You know what they came and said to us? We're not going to let these kids get ahead of us. We're going to memorize verses too. And that group of gals and group of guys memorized those verses we taught the Romans road to them. They taught it to us. And then they went off to school using their Bibles, their New Testament, and witnessing. The ideal church is a loving church and a love for the Bible. The David in the Old Testament loved the law. He loved the Word of God. Turn to Psalm 119. Go back into the Old Testament to the book of Psalms 119. I love the readings of David, and I know that you do too. And uh, young man, think about him out on the hillside shepherding sheep. It was there that he learned how to pray. It was there he learned to listen to God. Out in a desert, a young man, a shepherd boy that became a king. You ever heard that song, The Shepherd Boy That Became a King? If you've not heard that song, tremendous, uh, tremendous song. Psalm 109, or I'm sorry, 119, verse 7. I'll get there in just a moment. Psalm 119 and verse 7. My verse, my paper is sticking together. I'm sorry. Here we are. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart. When shall I have learned thy righteous judgments? I will keep thy statutes, O forsake me not utterly. Now look at verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed unto or according to the word. I, I can't stop there. I've got to go. I've got to go on. Watch. With all my whole heart have I sought thee. I wonder how many of us say that and mean that. Hmm. With my whole heart I have sought thee. 
Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Now I want you to watch the succession here. Watch. A young man or a young lady. By the way, we need to start teaching our kids that right away. When we have children, we ought to teach them to memorize the Word of God right away. Amen? And uh, what a difference that makes. And so the psalmist says, if a young man is going to cleanse his way, he has to give heed to the Word. And then with all my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And then he goes on. So you see how important the word of God is? You see how important the law was to David? Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 over in the New Testament. The book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's love was for the word of God. And that's 2 Timothy, if you will. 2 Timothy. David had a love for God's law, but also you come to the New Testament, and what do you find? You find Paul having his love for the parchments. Chapter 4 and verse 13. Now watch what he says. Well, go back up to verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Let me stop there a second. Did you know serving God can become difficult at times? Do you know to be a servant of God, it gets lonely at times? And here was a great man of God. And he's saying, do your diligence to come shortly unto me. Demas has forsaken me. That's back in verse 9. People are going to forsake you. Having loved this present world and has departed unto Thessalonica, Christians unto Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychius have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carphus, and when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, now watch this, and the books, but especially the parchments. He especially wanted the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written, but now he was wanting the Old Testament. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord rewarded him according to his works. Whom be there aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. People are going to withstand you and I. And my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that you may not lay it at their charge. Now we'll look at verse 17. I love it. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I could go on and on and on. So here are two men. They loved the Word of God. Jesus himself was an example in the garden. And Paul exhorted us again and again and again. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Write that down. Exhorting us to do what? To love the Word of God. Write down Revelation 3, verse 7 through 9. Revelation 3, verses 7 through 9. And there you see the church at Philadelphia and how God used them. And then you see how the church at Jerusalem was blessed in Acts chapter 2. Write down verse 1, chapter 4, verse 24, and chapter 5 through verse 12. So here's David, and here's Paul, and here is Jesus. And here is an ideal, loving church. They know the Word, but they practice it with one another. Now... Next week, we'll look at the ideal local church as a local church.
and then we'll look at the ideal church as a laboring church. We'll finish up uh, there in that area. Do you get the idea that God loves his church? Do you love, think he loves his church? Then he wants us, are you listening? He wants us to be the ideal church. He wants us to be the ideal church. Not fussing and fighting, arguing, but have the ideal church so he can get glory to himself through us. Now, where are you and where am I in the will of God? Where am I? Can I tell you, can you tell me I'm in the will of God now? Stand with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you will.